Hey everyone, welcome to the 325th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by the one and only Kyle McConaughey. Thanks, Kyle. I'm Warren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today we've got Pete Chapman on the show. Regular listeners will recognize his name, and people who watch television will (laughs) even more likely recognize his name. Since we last spoke, he's been tearing it up, directing all sorts of prestige television. We talk about all all sorts of credits that he has racked up, but real quick, you, Love Life, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Blackish, Long Slow Exhale, The Flight Attendant, Mythic Quest, The Unicorn, Grey's Anatomy, (laughs) Gronish, just an name a few and multiple episodes of all of these yeah tons and tons of stuff and the crazy thing is he didn't start directing tv till like three years ago so it's not like he's like an old tv veteran he's just uh, (laughs) a workaholic pete is a true treat to talk to he's so great tons of tangible nuggets of information that you can use to better your career and your practice and your craft all at once he himself has his own podcast called let's shoot with pete chapman that you can check out as well and like i said he's directing television all the time so it's a really great conversation good to catch up with him every once in a while these episodes just feel like they just flow Just flow and just like talk to an old friend. And like, we don't know Pete super well, but it felt like that. It felt like just like grabbing drinks, like after a a shoot or something. It was really fun. And I think it's worth mentioning that even though he is a very successful TV director, many of the things we talk about are applicable to any director at any stage of their career. It was not that long ago that he was coming up. And so I think the lessons that he learned and the experiences that he had he came up in digital he's kind of you know the new model of of where directors come from and so his experience is more applicable than people who came up in different generations basically i actually just did the math i think his very first tv episode was in 2018 yet somehow he's directed 372 episodes of tv there must be some clones running around right anyhow he's great before we chat with pete We're going to talk real quick about something I'm wondering, which is what you've been thinking about lately. (laughs) Yeah, well, we talked about it a little bit with Pete, but I think that I was tooling around on the internet the other day and uh, our old friend, Andy Radzewski, who I've known for years and years and years, is a a good, good pal. DP of Pen15. And DP of Pen15 and Dollface and a bunch of other stuff. A guy I've shot with, you know, as much as I've shot with anyone. Anyway, he was talking about being a DP and stuff. And he talked about how the thing that he wished he could have told himself was that having a good attitude and being positive and being good to be around, being generous, being kind, being thoughtful, being positive is the number one reason that he continues to get rehired. He would have thought that it was his quality of work or something like that. But because this job is so strenuous and so involved and so intimate, that oftentimes the attitude is the most important thing. And it really, really struck me. It really cut me to the core, actually, because I felt myself over the years losing some of that thoughtfulness being a little less generous, a little less open, and a little less joyful, I think, as a result in doing this work, because it is something that really is important to me on a spiritual level, man. And so, you know, I have really consciously tried to recalibrate some of that thinking and that mentality. I haven't had a ton of opportunities to, to practice that yet. You know, certainly on set is the easiest place to like really test yourself because you're like under a ton of stress and You're interacting with people every single second, you know, when you're at home. You're saying onset is the easiest place to to test? Yeah, it's the easiest place to test your metal, to really see if you're committed to that mentality of being. Whereas like, you know, if you're on like a handful of Zooms every day and you're on mute for half of the time, it's like it's a little harder to kind of practice that openness, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. I hadn't realized how different I feel now than I did when I first started making things and shooting with my friends. Don't you think that is why? Because you, when you shoot with your friends, when you work on 50 college humor sketches in a row with the same people over and over, all trying to make things as funny as possible. And then you transition into client work where, you know, maybe three or four people on set and you have people kind of pushing against you want to make things as funny as possible 
and they have other requirements and goals that are mm-hmm. sometimes at odds with your goals. Like is what you're saying that you need to still find the joy despite the much harder environment to find that joy in? I, I'm saying that I've always loved directing, but the act of community building, the act of collaboration, the act of looping people in, listening to them, setting the table for an environment where people can communicate cleanly and clearly takes a lot of work. And like in a commercial environment, sometimes it's it's just, it's especially hard to do that stuff. But as I'm developing relationships with longer term clients and like I think that you can still create those opportunities and you can still bring your people along and when you meet new people make a more concerted effort to to engage with them to connect with them to like learn about them you know and that's all exhausting and that's that's the reason I think why I stopped doing it maybe as much as I'd like is because it's like look after you know your 20th new hair and makeup person you're not as close to them as the first one who did all of your jobs together for years and years and years you know but it doesn't have to be like that you have to, you can still go out of your way and i think that it's just good to remind yourself that you should do that basically in whatever way you see fit but i guess i'm trying to say that like life is too short to not put in the effort to do that do you give uh, like a little speech at the beginning of shoots i used to I used to, and and we've talked about it on the show recently. I'd forgotten that I did. It was a little prayer. It was a little like congregation. It was a little ritual of like, hey, everyone, let's make something special. And I, I respect and appreciate the sarcasm that that elicits or the eye roll that that elicits because there are plenty of people who aren't interested in or don't have the time or aren't paid well enough or whatever to to engage in that behavior but if you wanna the water is fine and also if you continue to give people those opportunities maybe that rekindles a little bit of the joy that they felt when they decided to become a part of this artistic process as well like one of our advantages of uh, hosting a directing podcast is that we get to ask other directors about their process. And it's probably not a bad idea for us to ask other directors, like if they do give a speech and what they say Mm -hmm. at the beginning of shoots, especially look, it's one thing to do like your indie feature that you wrote and are directing sure, producing. Right. Yeah. It's another thing to do an episode of TV or a two day commercial shoot or a, you know, episodic branded series, because it's like you're saying when you're, when you're doing a cat fancy, you know, cat food mm-hmm. commercial, maybe it's a little hard to give the we're all doing something special speech. But but there is, I feel like what you're saying, your premise for this topic is we are doing something special. We're like mm-hmm. making things like whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, a commercial for diapers or whether it's, you know, it, it, a it, true it, story it, about struggles sure. in right, someone's yeah. life. Or or my my web series or the short that I've been dreaming of for the last. 20 years it can also be a little content agnostic right because what i'm really saying is like let's appreciate each other and let's create a environment where we're facilitating that right and 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 doing that through action and attitude um you know all of that stuff trickles down but you know you only have control over the way that you perceive things and i just was like you know, just acknowledging like, hey, that's a great idea. Like, awesome. Like, engaging, being excited, being kind, working at being kind, you know. And I think that especially with the last few years that everyone's had and also being tired and sleep deprived in a way that's pretty real and pretty constant right now, you have to just remind yourself to be the person you want to be. I do think I do want to get back into the speeches, a really short one, you know, like a three yeah. sentence thing. Don't waste people's um, time, but show them that you appreciate them. Yeah. The other thing that I believe someone told us about Greta Gerwig, it could have even been you years ago on the podcast was the name tag, thing. name tag thing. Yeah. And it's such an easy thing to do. And like, I'm trying to think in my mind, if I'm like a, you know, old gristled grip showing up to set and someone's like, Hey, put this name tag on. And they're like, what the fuck is this name tag for? And 
they're like, well, the director just wants everyone to wear name tags. Mm -hmm. I feel like they'd be like, fine. And then I'd see them. I'd be like, Rick, how's it going? I'm more. Yeah. Um, And it would be nice work on that thing. I I see you. And I think um, it would be maybe like a little woo woo, even though it's just a name tag up front, but would totally pay off. And maybe I have a shoot coming up July 6th and 7th. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll try the name tag thing. That's an easier thing than the speech thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I don't know that I've ever told told this story, uh, but uh, I was a PA on a feature film for a director that I idolized, loved, loved, loved. Who I guess I'll just say his name is Mike Mills. It was the pickup on his his first feature, Beginners, or something before that, Thumbsucker. Oh, Thumbsucker, yes. And I'm like wafting haze, smoke, haze. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm on the left side and somebody else is on the right. And he's calling like, Matt, you know, uh, faster, slower, roll roll it or whatever. Rick, do this, whatever. Right. But, the same but, grip than... than <laughs> so, yeah, the same. But so he, he addressed us both by name. And I, I don't... Mike didn't know my name. But it was really helpful and it, like encouraging. And I was like in it. And then I realized that he... Someone, maybe it was him. Maybe he asked for it. some, Or maybe one of his people was smart enough to think this through wrote our names in tape on On either on the matching sides of the monitor so he didn't have to remember and i was just like i was a tiny bit disappointed for a second but also no it's great like that's better than like i I typically would just kind of be like okay you uh on the left the Hayes team let's get yeah, a little yeah, more off yeah, yeah. The, like our, our Hayes friends all right <laughs> yeah and that's what the ad was. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and it's like okay well just it's okay that you you got a lot on your mind you don't remember my name but like someone being thoughtful enough to facilitate being me being called by my name i think that's the sort of ethos that i want to engender in people yeah and i think if you can find a way to know learn people's names it's actually a much more efficient way of communicating oh, it's better. because you yeah. can yell to someone across the room and say yeah samantha could you like yeah lift yeah. this light up a little bit or whatever yeah, yeah. um yeah I, so i'll make this real quick but the thing i've been thinking about is the opposite because i've been you know i'm sure all of us are going through various levels of anxiety and stress and worry you know <laughs> with the world um as it is and good days and bad days and good projects and bad projects. But, you know, I love directing. I've kind of been in like, like in my free time, I'm spending less time watching movies and TV shows and reading Mm -hmm. about cameras and hanging out with actors and performances and watching shows. Like I feel like my brain is not being exercised in the film art creative world as much as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Cause I would really crave, crave that. And I'm not even really doing like Blender, you know, 3D graphics stuff, which I feel like is in the same world as like mm-hmm. creative u- using like where technology and art meet, you know, which is filmmaking also. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about whether like, is it okay to like not always be 1000% gung ho? I love directing in your career. Like if you work in any other career, if you work on Wall Street and if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a dentist, you can have times my aunt was a doctor ear nose and throat doctor and she like hated her job for like two years because she had some difficult patients and things you know and she dreaded going to work but then she loved it again later because you know she kind of mm-hmm. moved on past that like are we only good in our jobs if we are living breathing dreaming mm-hmm. film or can we also like just do it as a job sometimes yeah yeah that's a really great question and I understand, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been in a phase in my life where I have craved the weekends more, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's called having a family. Yeah. You just like, oh, man, wouldn't it be nice to not work and to just like blow bubbles in the backyard for a while? That's all I want to do. I think that there's a type of director that I think we all wanted to be once upon a time. I'm talking about. Spielberg or Steven Soderbergh or, or Tarantino or like yeah someone I mean, that's obsessed with their own and and I also mean work. prolific right like I'm I'm naming people who are like oh yeah I produce stuff as well I do TV you know just like Soderbergh retired you know 
a few years ago and has made more movies than most people make in a career, you know, in that time mm-hmm. of his quote unquote right. retirement. You can't be that person and not be all in. And also, it's okay to not want to be Steven Soderbergh. You know, I think the the flip side, I was listening to an interview with Kelly Reichardt, who did First Cow, which I really, really loved. And, you know, they brought up the point like, you know, I don't know what First Cow's budget was, but it wasn't a ton of money. And Kelly Reichardt made plenty of movies that like, you know, she probably made 50000 or or $100,000 on. But when you think about how she's made, she makes a movie every three years, all of a sudden that amount of money isn't especially substantial for living on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and she's a film professor in Portland and she like hangs out with Todd Haynes and like has this cool groovy, like it's not even Portland. It's like somewhere less groovy than that. It's like less, it's like Eugene. Yeah. Yeah. It might be Eugene, but like, you know, like a cool Pacific Northwest, you know, professor's life and then goes and makes a movie, you know, sometimes with a 24, but I don't know that she cares a ton, Uh, you know, every 18 months or whatever. And I remember hearing that and was being like, dang, Kelly, you figured it out, right? It's like a nice mellow life where you still get to make movies. She also makes movies either with like Michelle Williams or with no movie stars. You know, when you have that sort of legacy or pedigree or whatever, you can kind of pull that off. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that like you don't have to be obsessed you can still live your life. And I think that makes you a better filmmaker. But even like Spielberg and like, I know he like was very involved in like the Holocaust museum in Israel. Like, and I know he probably like dives into a world, like when he's making Schindler's list, Mm -hmm. he learns so much about this world. And then there's all these things that happen off of that. You know, he immerses himself in, in world. That's why we get so many Titanic submarine documentaries from James Cameron. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then when Spielberg made that, um, movie about the eighties. What's it called? Ready player one. Mm -hmm. He like learned about like ET and all these other things from the eighties. Anyhow. Yeah. I think we should be allowed to take a mental break from, you know, Uh, yeah. From our passion. (laughs) I guess what I, what I'm really trying to say to you, Warren, is that not only is that something that I advocate for and I think is a good thing, but I think it will make you better in the long run anyway having the time to think about things and experience life in a different way. Like, I don't know that you're going to accumulate that many more insights from blender tutorials or, or video essays or whatever your obsession is. You'd probably be better. I think you'd be better off living life and like going camping with your family and then coming back to the work fresh. Reading reviews of restaurants. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, being interested in things besides movies means that you'll more likely have something to say in your movies. Yeah, but I guess I'm also trying to say that it's okay to get a job and not be that excited about it, but still do it, still do a great job and still work hard and do all the things you need to do. Yeah. But you don't have to kill yourself over every job. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. On that note, on that note, five and a half months until I shoot my movie, five and a half months left. For those listeners that don't know what we're talking about, uh, Matt and I have a bet that he will not, I believe he will not shoot his feature this year because he has a kid and a job and a mortgage and everything else that gets in the way of those things. To be fair, the reason that it's taking so long now is um, more because I've let Hollywood take over. Like we sent it out to people going to take them two weeks before they read it we're going to ping them they're going to say oh yeah we're going to get to it or my boss still needs to read it and then two months will go by none of those reasons matter (laughs) for our bet (laughs) well well, the the, for our bet certainly not no but like my kid is not the thing slowing me down at at this moment for sure doesn't mean i'm more or less likely to get that hundred bucks yeah i think your kid is what is stopping you from spending every waking hour pressuring people and finding new avenues and angles of getting that film made. Yeah. Fair enough. No offense to your kid. All, all, yeah. all kids. <laughs> yeah. 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 Before we talk to Pete, just want to remind people real quick, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. It's a place where you can support the podcast. If you give us any amount of money, we will mention your name in the beginning of the podcast. If you give us 20 bucks, 
even for only one month, we will send you a Just Shoot It podcast hat, which is stylish and cool and will protect your head from the harmful UV rays Mm -hmm. of most suns. So check it out. Patreon.com slash Just Shoot It pod. And anything else to add, Matt? Let's talk to our friend Pete Chapman right after a word from our sponsors. We're back on with Pete Chapman. Thanks for coming back, Pete. Hey, that feel like, you know, it, it ain't often you get to come back to a great co- podcast a second time um, uh, and not have not have scandal attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you do have some explaining to do, though, Pete. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're excited to have a, another director on. Someone with your accolades is great. But even more exciting is that you are also a podcast host. That's right. That's yes. right. It does make a difference. It is nice. Yeah, maybe you should just interview us. But anyway, uh, Pete, we were saying before we started rolling, Pete, that you, uh, the last time we spoke, you know, things were going well for you. You had, you know, a ton of great credits. And then I just pulled up your INDB to just kind of refresh my memory. And I see a hell of a lot of television in 2019, 2020, and 2021. Like a a lot of TV. I think last time you were on here, you had done... The unicorn was kind of a recent thing. Obviously, we've done grownish, mixedish, blackish. Mm-hmm. Did you do blackish? Yeah, I had done blackish then too, for sure. Yeah, because I've, I've done six episodes of that show. Oh, why is it not on here on your IMDb? You just have to keep scrolling, Oren, because there's so much. Grey's Anatomy, The Unicorn, Mythic Quest, All Rise, Blind Spotting, You, Love Life, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Blackish, Long Slow Exhale, The Flight Attendant, as well as your podcast, just yeah. to name a few. So we were asking, though, Pete, if there was any sort of... If you could uh, save some episodes for the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, but, but if there was like any sort of moment, a pivotal moment that kind of launched you into the second act of your career, basically. Like going from like kind of like a, a few episodes here and there to basically like... Working nonstop. The most like, in-demand TV director. Like truly, you know? I don't know how you have enough time in the year to do as many episodes as it looks like you've done in 2020. At the same time as producing a child. Yeah. <laughs> that And that, that's that been the, I was going to say the hardest part, but the most fulfilling part. Um, I, well, look, I'll, I'll say this in the beginning to kind of give a little runway to the answer. Like in the beginning, you're just kind of like, who's going to hire me, you know? And I, I think that one, I don't know how much of it was luck or strategy or whatever, but I was real fortunate to kind of fall into three different camps in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So like my, my very first episode that I ever booked was blackish. Um, so then I'm in the, I'm in the Kenya Barris ish world ish universe. Mm -hmm. And, um, I booked that, like in April of what, 17 to, to shoot in November of 17. But then Gronish got greenlit. And because I was a, now an approved director, I got Gronish second, but directed it first because mm-hmm. it shot before. Mm-hmm. So like I did Gronish and then I, then I did Blackish and then I got brought back to Gronish. And so like when you get to, uh, <laughs> when you get to the whole like timeline of everything, you know, it, it turned out that I did six grownish and six blackish, right? So like that was like really from one family, twelve episodes of TV. I luckily was brought into that camp. And then the second camp was not in order, but just in my memories order right now, was the always sunny guys, right? Mm-hmm. And so like when I did and that worked. I, I'm gonna. I like to kind of give context because I feel like for people listening, it's good to anecdotally hear. Like, you know, on that first episode of Grownish um, that I did, the guy shooting directing before me um, is now a friend, Todd Bierman. And so, like, we were just shooting the shit in the parking lot because the prepping director parks next to the shooting director, and something happened with. Um, the show Mythic Quest and they were looking for a director and he and Rob go back to high school, Rob McElhenney. And he was like, Oh, Rob, you should meet this guy, Pete. So I have this, you know, we Mm -hmm. hit it off in the parking lot. I then have a meeting with Rob and I do an episode of Mythic Quest. And while we were shooting that episode and we were kind of navigating, you know, the challenges of production and I was kind of trying to be cool as a fan. Can I just stop you for a second? So when you meet with Rob, you hadn't done Always Sunny yet at this point. 
No, I hadn't. What do you guys talk about? Is he like, so what do you think is funny? Or like, well, and, and to clarify, is this literally just in the parking lot as well? Or you came in to sit down? With him? <laughs> so I met Rob at, uh, at their office or an office. I don't know what mm-hmm. office it was. It was an office uh, in Santa Monica. Gotcha. Um, and I so a little more like, formal than just like, a, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 But like, you know, I like I read the script for Mythic Quest. Uh, I was uh, you know, it's, what's really funny is like I had kind of watched Always Sunny, but never really gotten into it very deeply. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I can't go meet this guy and like not watch. I got a couple of friends who are like my TV gurus. And I'm like, yo, where should I where should I begin? What should I watch? And so I probably watched like 20 episodes over the weekend. And I sure. was like. I was like, this which is, is like five percent of that show. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's been on forever. <laughs> and I started. I started with um, the gang turns black or whatever. With, with, I think that was the. I think that was the title of it. Um, and I was like, okay, this is some wild shit, but it was smart. And so I was like, okay, Wait, what I, happens I, in that? I, I've never. I haven't really seen the show. What happens in that episode? In that episode. Um, Okay, it's so crazy. It's one of it's like when you talk about Seinfeld or Curve, you like you sound ridiculous when you recount it. <laughs> but there's like a there's a, a black homeless guy that's kind of that is in their apartment and they're watching The Wiz, um, and the gang was not familiar with this film, um, and lightning strikes or something happens and then they wake up or they come out of this lightning strike and they are black. And they recognize it, of course, when they look in the mirror. And so it's a musical. And they're and played by it, other actors. They're played by other actors. And it goes through, you know, like they can't find their keys, you know, is one, uh, is one scenario. And they're trying to break into um, Dennis's Range Rover. And, of course, the cops pull up. And it goes through all of these different scenarios. And it ends with Charlie, like, who's a kid, getting shot by a cop. And uh-huh. it's, it, I mean, it's walking so many fucking lines, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? While also being thoughtful about it. And I was like, I ain't even mad at this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm watching it like this is, this is really smart. So. And those actors that, are doing impressions of like Charlie and Rob and. Right. The rest of the cast. Right. I mean, it, it, it's, it, <laughs> it was, it was, dare I say it was like, it was a beautiful episode. And so um, I was like, okay, I, I really like what these guys are doing and have been doing. And so we have the meeting and we just kind of talk about, um, you really just talk about who you are and your sensibility and where you're from. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're strategic and smart, you know, uh, you make sure to show how who you are kind of connects to the themes that they like to explore in, in, in whatever show that you're meeting about. Do you talk um, at all about like, oh, I love wide shots <laughs> or like, or like any, it. anything technical, like directory, like, oh, I love talking to, I mm-hmm. love like just pitching jokes, mm-hmm. you know, or like, do you talk about directing at all or not really? I mean, you kind of, you kind of talk about, it's different for every meeting, but you kind of talk about, you kind of try and extract from what you watched the vibe of the folks. Mm-hmm. So like, mm-hmm. you know, one thing I'll tell you. Right. Or the format this, maybe. Yeah. Or the format or like, like the style, like he, one thing that was very clear, cause I did mythic quest first. He was like, when he asked me on set, he was like, Hey man, would you be interested in doing some sunny episodes? Um, and I was like, yeah, like he was like, it ain't nothing like this, you know, cause on mythic quest, <laughs> sure. you know, it's like the DP is Mike Berlucci who shot you are the worst and mm-hmm. who's doing, uh, uh, and this flag means death. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. like, it's got a very cinematic look. And he was like, Sonny is not this. I have and he's to like, be- didn't they shoot that show on like HVX 200? It's like for the first few seasons or like only like they had stage stuff. And then I don't know. I, I remember it was like super kind of lo-fi. Our friend was the first AD on it. Ross Novi. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's like, it's super like the, 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 the cameras are on like basically like, poles that the, that the that the operators can just hold mm-hmm. and it's basically a three camera multi-cam of sorts that turns around mm-hmm. and gets the reverse side you know right. um i wonder if that's so, kind of reminds me of like happy endings too i bet they kind of shot that like that too or i mean i was gonna say brooklyn 99 i think it's kind of a similar mm-hmm. thing where it's like you've got three cameras 
they're operating. Maybe you flip the room. Maybe, but you probably ideally right. you're kind of blocked to like not have to. Yeah. So, so, you know, like that one episode of mythic quest led to four out of 10 episodes of sunny in season mm-hmm. 14. And then in season 15, I came back and I did two more. Um, Wait, how do they give so, you four out of 10 episodes? Aren't there like editors and actors and producers and all these other people in line to get these episodes? And this is where the, you know, a little bit of opportunity, you know, luck, what is opportunity plus preparation? Like they, they really like, it's a family vibe there. Like that mm-hmm. show, there were times that I was home, like I didn't eat lunch there. You know what I mean? Like we would move so quickly that, mm-hmm. you know, cause with those three cameras, they're kind of getting everything that they want. These guys are r- collectively writing every episode. They're like, no, we got it. And mm-hmm. you know, they kind of need to work with folks who understand that mm-hmm. and can vibe with that. Mm-hmm. And so I think there was a, maybe a bit of a, you know, let's see what happens the first time, but it all worked out. Um, and do you, you know, do director's so, cuts on that show? Yeah, you do. You do. That family ended up being six episodes of, of Sunny and three episodes of Mythic Quest because in season two, I got two more. Mm-hmm. And then the third family was or is the Shondaland family. So mm-hmm. I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I'm just so, so curious about so many things. Mythic Quest yeah. versus Always Sunny. So in Always Sunny, they, it's, I'm sure you're working on season like 25 and <laughs> you're already like they have this way they shoot. The producers are also the writers and also the actors and also the editors and also the showrunners. With Mythic Quest, I mean, I know Rob, it's like Rob's show, and I'm sure he's like kind of in control of a lot of things. But like you said, there's more cinematic look, mm-hmm. a DP that comes from a film background. It's a different network, yeah. right? Like there's kind of, it's a different ball of wax is what you're getting right. at. Right. Yeah. yeah. So right. do you approach your job as a director differently? Like on Always Sunny, is it more about creating opportunities for rhythm and and laughs and jokes and performance mm-hmm. and maybe on mythic quest a little bit more like visual storytelling or like, like what's the difference between how you approach your job on those two shows? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for, for always sunny, I'm thinking how can I block or how can I offer blocking suggestions for the actors that will fall into this three camera setup? And maybe need one special, you know, if it calls for it. Right. right. And, you know. Can you tell for our listeners that don't know what a special is? Can you define uh, it? Yeah. So, you know, it's like, oh, and then we'll get, you know, this overhead shot looking down at the bar. Or we'll do some kind of special transition off of a beer mug to but something a, out of know, the ordinary, something that's copy. not in their typical coverage, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, and I guess the most, the simplest way to think of it is like something that is going to be probably a one camera deal <laughs> versus right. like, you know what I right. mean? Like versus like, a, um, I've got three cameras and every, cause the moment you, you say, Hey, one camera, people are like, Whoa, wait, wait, <laughs> you know, <laughs> why are we wasting time? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, well, I, and that, to be fair, it is, you know, like two thirds is less effective, right? That's 60 percent slower than, well, than everything else. Right. right in, in a right. certain sense. Right. And if like, you if know you're that on, that shot gets into the edit, then it's exactly as effective as 10 cameras because you're only going to use right. one. I mean, unless sure. it's Mortal Kombat or something and you're re- yeah, yeah. replaying the angle seven times. You have to know when you want to, like, expose yourself for mm-hmm. that because people might be like, what the fuck is this guy doing? You know what I mean? Or they might say, okay, I agree. That makes sense. And, um, you know, we'll give you one because you're, you're, you're so efficient with everything else. Mm-hmm. Do you well, try and find a special in each scene? No, no. I, I, I try and, I try and find, I, tr- I think about, I think blocking is directing in all honesty. Like, I feel like the shows often will shoot themselves. Like I can try and find specials or other ways to, Mm -hmm. you know, be original, but like if the blocking is creative and thoughtful and perhaps unique to my approach to the scene, then it's going to be different from if Matt or Warren directed it, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. um, and then 
I guess my little kind of secret is I'll try and push the envelope on things that are unique to my episode. So like if I, like if I have a montage or like take flight attendant as, a, as an example, like there's this whole like um, uh, flight training scene sequence in the episode. And they were like, look, we're not going to be prescriptive on when you tile, you know, like kind of go into like the different boxes and move things around. Like we're not going to, we don't write it in. We're not going to be prescriptive, but like, you know, if you think there's a place to do it, go for it. <clears throat> and so in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that sequence, there were like five or six different tiling things that I came up with that I knew I had the, I had the kind of, I don't want to say wiggle room because that's not it, but I had the, I had the support to kind of carve out something unique. Did you have to get it approved by showrunners? Like, do you put no, together that, like an animatic or something? That was a very, that's one of the shows. And, and this is kind of, you know, kind of getting to the first question. Like, this is why I really love, you know, streaming shows and premium cable, because a lot of times, depending on the show, they are looking to hire people to interpret the script. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you know, you're going to be in a position uh, to offer up ideas around how you think this can be shot. And they're looking for you to do that. That's exciting to hear, Pete, because I feel like, you know, for so long you hear about network directors who are kind of, you know, uh, there to execute, right? But but maybe not necessarily bring their own vision to the table and that like the vision of the show is kind of already established in the pilot and the showrunners and the writers are guiding that. Right. And so you're there to kind of serve that and that oftentimes part of like maybe the biggest reason that directors don't get asked back if it is, if they're not, if they don't understand and jive with that vision. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's interesting because I, I was going to say like, oh, part of maybe what clicks for you with each of these families is this ability to both, you know, sink in and also make it special at the same time without without rocking the boat too hard. Right. I want to point out that you said, you know, maybe your secret ingredient, that's the, the special thing that you bring to the table is knowing when to inject your own creativity and when to kind of just service the story. And I think that's really awesome. That's incredible advice. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to know also because you want to like, you want to be indispensable as a director, Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) but you also, yeah, don't want to be difficult. Yeah. Right. I mean, I will say too, I feel like, you know, you know, cause I write and I produce and I think that along with some folks just kind of, being willing to, and this is part of the podcast, uh, like birth too. Like I want to talk to people and kind of see where they're coming from and have that temper where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I just think like, as if I just put a producer hat on and I'm like thinking about the things that I've been writing for years, you know what I mean? And then, you know, then let's say tomorrow it gets green lit. I'm not shooting a pilot until sometime in 2023. And then, you know, in 2024, it, when the season is shooting, some director is going to come up and like, tell me how it's going to be shot. <laughs> like, sure. yeah. I'd be like, are you uh, kidding me? I have a few ideas that I think are really going to spice this sequence up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I kind of have this like weird dream where I'm like, have like a show and I make a cool pilot. And then I meet these other directors that come and just totally take it to a new level. Like to me mm-hmm. that, that there's something exciting about seeing how other directors would interpret something. But, mm-hmm. but like you're saying, of course there's tone and there's things that could be wrong. And today I heard this interview with Bill Hader where mm-hmm. I guess he's directing every single episode of season four of Barry. Wow. And he said that on season three and two, he just, he would have these tone meetings with the directors and he would basically be telling them how he, it should be shot. And he felt like, they had their own ideas and he's like, uh, okay. And he kept, he kept like letting people do what they wanted. Cause he didn't want to be like a dick, but he, he had, he had it in his brain a different way. He knew what he wanted. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. at some point everyone's like, why don't you just direct the whole season? Right. Also, if you look at yeah. the list of people who directed Barry episodes, they're the best. 
Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like he's like, I don't know, hero. I saw it a different way. <laughs> you know, like like literally some of the best directors working. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, well, so sorry, you were saying you had your third family, which is the Shondaland oh, family. Yeah. And so the third family, yes, the Shondaland family. And that was what was that? Uh, oh, I left off a mixed dish episode from from the Ish universe. So that's thirteen episodes of TV. Uh, there's six and three, nine with uh, the uh, RCG guys, always sunny folks, and then with Shonda Land, I did Station Nineteen, three Grey's Anatomy, and I'm going to do a fourth. In so that's five more. So mm-hmm. like just right. right there, that's like five plus. 13, what's that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Eight, 18, and then another nine, 18 and nine. That's fucking 27 episodes of TV just with one job, hi- with three job hirings, in, mm-hmm. in, in arguably. And so um, that was really helpful for me to kind of get a career going. And then, you know, every time you get hired, there are other people who begin to get comfortable with the idea of working with you because someone else has hired you and more importantly, rehired you. Um, the worst thing that they say you can find on an IMDb page is a bunch of like single episode uh, mm-hmm. tallies um, because it's like, well, what the fuck was happening? You know? So when, when COVID hit and we were all just home and I finally had a time to like not watch things that were guided by a meeting, I was watching a lot of shows and I was like, I like this show. I would reach out to my reps and say, Hey, you know, do, do your rep thing, please. Um, and I've got a great manager, Stephen Marks at Dowden entertainment, great agent, uh, Brandon Lawrence at CAA. And I'm like, uh, and even my lawyer, Andre De Roche, like which of the three of you awesome folks can like mm-hmm. tap a shoulder. And so like I watched you and I was like, I fucking thought that shit was great. You know what I mean? I watched love life and I thought that that was great. Um, and so, You know, it was I began to get more specific about going for shows that I responded to. And I think the likelihood of you responding to something that is already creatively in your wheelhouse is probably pretty high. Mm -hmm. And so then you're showing up and it's like a perfect handshake of like what you want to do meets what the show is looking for you to do. Um, and over the, I guess that was 2020, I started doing more shows that were like, almost like I, I applied to a job that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would really strongly recommend folks like do that because a lot of times, like, you know, people work so long on a show that, and they care so much about a show. It's great to have, have a rep say, Hey, Oren loves your show. And would love to direct an episode and like, they'll be like, okay, let me hear this motherfucker. Tell me why they love my shit. Like who's, everybody's got 10 minutes for that. Right. It's really interesting because you have, so you have this like procedural background from Shondaland. You have this comedy background from like the ish Mm -hmm. world and Mm -hmm. like the Kenya world and the um, always sunny world. But then a show like you, which is, I haven't seen it, but it's like a dramatic thriller type show. Right. Yeah. Like it's kind of high tension action t- suspense like romance so, right yeah, yeah. like it, it, it's kind of and and you know i got episodes that had a lot of action it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a, a mix of everything it, it's a show that knows what it is mm-hmm. and kind of requires you to understand genre and know when you need to lean on your you know romantic comedy when mm-hmm. you need to lean on your like i'm about to kill this person, you know, uh, skill set. So how did you pitch yourself on that? Kind of given that everything you'd done, like your kind of major background was in slightly different areas of TV. I think the beautiful thing of the industry is, especially when you talk to the right people, 90%, I hate when people fucking pick a random percentage, but you yeah, know, like 88.6, you can be specific. 88.6% <laughs> of people, you know, are, are not in jobs that they love to be in. So like mm-hmm. you could be meeting with an exec at Apple TV who wishes they were at Netflix. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like, I, I feel like we can all kind of comfortably be 
passionate and honest about what, you know, in a corny way makes our creative heart flutter. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And like, I think that when people hear that, they're like, oh, okay. Like, cause we, at a certain point, like we're all arguably competent if we're in the room. Right. Then it's like, well, what are you going to bring to this? That like, are you going to elevate this? Are you going to be a pleasure to be around? And so, you know, I just really try and find the things that really make me engaged about a show um, and speak about how, like, I have a personal connection to it and really be clear about my interest in having the opportunity to direct on that show. I love that so much. And it's funny, I feel like over the last few months i've kind of lost sight of some of that stuff just to get personal for a a tiny second like i had to kind of consciously remind myself to like like my job and Mm -hmm. to like appreciate it and to pay attention to it and and just like engage on kind of a spiritual creative level you know the your your point of like what makes your creative heart flutter that's it that's like essential to artists i believe Mm -hmm. and i think that 88.6% 88.6% of us <laughs> kind of lose sight of that sometimes and or maybe shy away from talking about it or engaging with it. Maybe engaging with it is really what I'm trying to talk about. And what I'm hearing from you, Pete, is just like, it's, it's just you showing the evidence of why you're going to make something good and why you care. And showing mm-hmm. that to people is inspiring. It's good to be around. And it's the difference between you know, being jaded and not, right? So like, why not live your life? I think it yields more work. And that's a thing that I've ignored for a long time over the last few years. I was, since I started this podcast with Oren, I, I think maybe yeah, there's I've something been to do with it. slowly poisoning him uh, <laughs> with uh, subconscious yeah. um, brain suggestions. I think there's also kind of what you're saying earlier, Pete, about like, like obviously you, your career was pretty much on fire, but you went from a place where you had these jobs that were probably pretty easy for you to get work that was easy to get and work that you wanted to do. And when those things weren't aligning perfectly, you pushed for the work you wanted to do. And that's something Matt and I talk about a lot. It's really hard, Mm -hmm. especially when you have kids and, you know, a mortgage and all these things in your life that don't care about your creative (laughs) satisfaction. It's hard to turn down the easy to get job in order to go fight for the hard to get job you know right yeah Um, no i mean i think it's it's spot on and it's like i don't know man i I feel like most recent position as a producing director on this hulu show like it's been really interesting to me being involved with you know prepping mm -hmm. other directors you know Mm -hmm. and like Mm -hmm. interviewing other people who are going to be on the crew and i and you kind of there are things that i've known you know, whether, whether they were like innate or people had shared them with me anecdotally, but like now I'm like, Oh man, like I would much rather have this fewer credit person around for 15 hours a day (laughs) than this person, (laughs) than this jerk who's got like nominations and wins because that's going to fucking exhaust me. You know what I mean? And like, or, or you just kind of like, you really see um, the value of passion and 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 also like just doing a good job. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Like it's it, 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 that part gets overlooked, and and I and I say to folks all the time, like you know, I don't I don't take a meeting where I can't say at the end of it, I would be honored to have the opportunity to direct your show. You know, and and I think about like all the other folks that, you know, maybe I'm giving away my shit right now, but like (laughs) I imagine in the, in the course of like all the director meetings that happen, not everybody's saying that. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? And so like the person who says that, who maybe has done less air quotes, you know, um, versus like the, the, the person who's done more and it just feels like they're like, whatever, like I'll take it or leave it. I'm just trying to have. 13 to 15 episodes on my calendar for the year and, you know, go to Ibiza and shit, you know, like, 
I think it ends up it, it met with the right people that matters. You know what I mean? And like, mm-hmm. then you end up finding like folks that you you do want to collaborate and work with. And and to that point, you know, the the producing director on you um, is a wonderful director. Her name is Silvertree. She was the producing director on um, Flight Attendant. So she brought me over. I had to interview sure. and I had to do all that. But like, she was like, oh, you'll, you'll love this guy. Berlanti, they knew me from you. And it was more about, you know, other folks that I had to kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, kind of pitch myself to. And then now I'm going to go to do Fatal Attraction with her in mm-hmm. October. So oh, wow. I guess Does that's my, have new, to my meet new you? family. Oh, yeah, we met. Yeah. And before you get the job, the directing job, especially because she's a, you know, an EP on the show and like, you know, it's, she's going to want to, she's going to want to know whether or not she's going to be able to vibe with that person. And, Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I don't know, I'm like beating a dead, dead horse, but, um, my DP on love life season two had been a DP on flight attendant season one. Mm-hmm. And so when I knew that, I told him how much I liked the show and like, I'd love to, you know, get involved with it. He was like, Oh man, you'd be great for that show. And he texted her. He was texting her, Adrian, uh, Pen Correa. He was texting her while I was zooming with her for the job. Oh, wow. That's always, that oh, never wow. hurts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when the person you're interviewing with is getting you recommended to them from someone they trust while you're interviewing with them. When you're the producing director, that's like a really cool point of view obviously to see how other directors work um you were saying that like you'd maybe rather take the more passionate director than the one that has you know the emmy awards i'm curious though like w- was there ever a situation where like a young kind of newer director that hadn't hasn't directed a ton of tv came in they were super passionate but they were kind of trying to reinvent the show in their point of view whereas the veteran director mm-hmm. might be like okay yeah so i noticed you guys start with the wides and then you do a you know, these zollies whenever this thing happens and we'll just do that. Right. right? We'll add a little spin here, some cool backlighting here and we're done. Like, is, was there any bit of that? Cause that, I'm assuming for the younger directors, you are kind of like a mentor as well. Right. Mm-hmm. At least on your show. Right. Right. Well, you know, having, having done so many episodes of TV and having had a variety of style of producing director, um, when I got the job, I, was like, all right, I, what is it that I loved about producing directors and what is it that I hated about producing mm-hmm, directors? Mm-hmm. Um, and can and, you, sorry, just define producing director real quick for our audience? Oh yeah. So, so, you know, on one hand you've got the showrunner or the, there's a new title, WEP, writer EP, and mm-hmm. that person is, um, involved or, 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 uh, their job is to kind of protect and develop the storylines, you know, the season arc and work to make sure that everything that happens day to day is preserving that vision. So, you know, the show can be the show, the producing director, which is mostly unique to one hour dramas. That person is there to help kind of ideally visually interpret what the showrunner's vision for the show is. And then to make sure that these directors that come through that rotate, you know, week to week are well prepped and aware of the vision of the show, the kind of challenges and pitfalls of the show, whether that's like cast crew budget or whatever. Um, And they are just equipped to make the best episode of the show possible. Um, and is that producing director on set with the other directors? Yeah, but I think, you know, like I would go to set often, but I want to fall back and be more involved with prep. So mm-hmm. when and, and, and exciting the crew about the director that's coming next. So when they get to set, it's their deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they've right. been hired to direct and, you know, you don't want to be around too often because people are going to be like, Hey Pete, well, what should we do? And that's not, <laughs> sure. Yeah. You're not ignoring them, them. Yeah, but you, you are whispering to the DP yeah. 40 instead of 50. Right. I love that so much because I feel like, especially in comedy, 
you know, showrunners oftentimes they're writers first and then executives second and or maybe director second or whatever. But like, you know, inevitably everybody has a specialty and then they're kind of uh, learning some of the other aspects on, on the job. Right. And a showrunner right. really is like kind of those three things all at once. You're an executive, you're a writer and you're a director. Right. Or at least typically. So like it, it always seemed like frankly, an impossible amount of work to be great oh, yeah. at all three of them. And also to be, you know, like relatively young and energized and like, you know, like it's a, just a crazy hard job. And I know that everyone's talking a lot about how we have like a real uh, showrunner problem because we have so much television and not enough people who've been trained in the jobs because they've been hiring the same people over and over and over again for the last 30 years. But I, I love the idea of you know, kind of like building different department heads, all of whom still answer to a showrunner, but who have a little bit more insight than, say, you know, a, an episode director. You know, like if you're just coming in for a couple of weeks, you just don't have a right. sense of the, the political landscape or the studio, any of that stuff. And so right. having having a person who understands your job and also the big picture is really awesome and, and right. also wants you to succeed <laughs> yeah yeah totally Which is important. yeah you're not right. in competition you're not like oh boy you know right <laughs> i think i feel like you were about to drop some chatman gold on us mm. uh before i asked you to define a producing director you were saying the traits that you saw in other producing directors that you really liked that you uh, oh, wanted to uh, incorporate yeah. right well, yeah. So like, you know, I remember there were a couple shows where like I got whether it was a document or a deck or, mm -hmm. you know, just something that was like, this is the language of the show. This is what we're going for with, you know, this storyline or, you know, framing or pace or whatever. Um, and so I've worked to put together a, you know, like 25 page deck that all the directors got that explained all of that, but also like what their prep time would look like, um, what production would look like, bios on all the people with photos, um, you know, yeah, suggestions, you know what I mean? Like I, awesome. and one thing I actually want to do awesome. for the next season is I want the, the crew list to have photos for all a hundred people mm -hmm. because when you come in and you're like, you know, Man, like, I mean, look, there's people I work with for six months. I don't know their fucking, I don't know their name. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and at a certain point, it almost gets weird to ask. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, it's like when you have a four hour um, conversation with someone on the airplane sitting next to you, and then as you're getting off the plane, you're like, uh, by the way, my name's Oren. <laughs> and they're like, oh, me too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, man, just trying to like make it, I don't know, less awkward and enjoyable because at the end of the day, it's a weird damn job to. To mm -hmm. come in and direct an episode of TV. When you are making this deck for the new directors, do you talk about like lensing and technical things, lighting, um, contrast? We had the DP of this Netflix show, End of the Effin World, and he showed us his deck that him and the director created, and it was had all sorts of rules about where they they place the camera and what lenses they use, and I found it like really fascinating and interesting and a nice insight into why the show feels the way it feels. Right. Right. We didn't get that specific. It was more, you know, with Kerry Washington having directed the pilot, I was using that as a guide for mm. what the look of the show would be, while also being aware of the fact that we would have nine days and not 14. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's like... Mm -hmm some of these things kind of no longer apply because we can't, we can't shoot like that. And so, um, it was just trying to find like, look, aesthetically, like, this is the goal. The, this is the feel for like, you know, it's a bit of a love triangle and, um, the two men in the, in the triangle with this, uh, one woman who is our lead character played by Amayasi Cornaldi. Um, what's, certain things happen narratively, there's a shift in how they are shot. Mm -hmm. And so like, that was an important thing to relay, you know, this idea of like, you know, her home is a little bit messy because she's got no time for maintaining it because of work. So like, if you can stage a kitchen scene with dishes in the sink, like that's a good thing, you know, just kind mm -hmm. of 
helping helping fill out the world about it. exactly exactly I can imagine like you get a directing job and they're like by the way these are some things that you can do to make the scene really mm-hmm. like you build out the universe how cool is that I can I ask you a hyper specific question <laughs> real quick sure, sure. And then I won't ask any more questions Matt then you can have all the rest of the questions <laughs> do you use the techno crane a lot and the stuff you direct um when I can get it yeah when I can get it, it's, you know, a lot of shows are, when you, when you get there and prep, they're like, we have one three camera day, you know, mm-hmm. you can, you, you can't get a crane, but you can get a jib, you know, like, you know, cause it's all budgeted and they have a pattern budget that they're trying to honor every episode. Um, but where I can most certainly I used in the flight attendant, I, I used it in a couple sequences. One got cut at, in, as a kind of establishing shot in, out in front of this liquor store um, when Cassie kind of takes her first drink in the present day um, and hops off the wagon. Um, but then we had this whole uh, synchronized swimming sequence and the camera just needed to be able to look straight down to kind of get that Busby Berkeley perspective. Um, so we had a huge crane um, in that in that scenario but you know that's one of those things that it, it's a it's a cost because you once you have the crane you have the operator then you need the remote head then you need the person who can put that together and mm-hmm, you know right. and you need the you time have, you need the time yeah but i you know but there's such a i think sometimes um sometimes that budgetary um vigilance <laughs> can have impacts that are unexpected like like you know you could you could not have let's say a a, you don't even need a techno crane it could it could be um i'm thinking of a piece of equipment and i can't think of the of the name right now but just like a short arm kind of crane and i can't think of Mm -hmm. the name of this thing but like you know i can think of times where i if i would have had that i could have moved quicker but i didn't and so now I had to make equipment do shit that it doesn't do. Mm-hmm. And now we're in, you know, minute 95 of something that I could have gotten in 40 minutes, you know, and you have to weigh the costs of like, well, now you're, you, you called grace. I'm getting in the weeds, but you know, you right. call grace and now you got overtime. It's like, well, was that better than not written the shit? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah, that's the reason I ask is because, I mean, you know, obviously like when you do, blackish and when you do these shows it's always sunny and they kind of have their very efficient way of shooting it's one thing but when you're doing the flight attendant which is second season i don't know matt how much of the second season you saw but like the camera work is like at another level from the first season you know it's like yeah. very visually mm-hmm. dynamic and like don't know what's real and what's not real and there's like a lot of like obviously the first season you're going in and out of her like psyche and her you know brain but in the second season i feel like you guys amp that up even more and then a show like you which i haven't seen but i imagine there's like probably more cinematic kind of camera movements and stuff yeah um and but whenever I, i've had the techno crane just like a handful of times and i'm always like like ooh, what shot like now i'm changing the entire shot list knowing that i have this crane and, sure and we push through this window and we do this and we do this tilt and, and now i'm like thinking of all these moves that aren't even necessary for the scene just because i right. can do them and I get this like crane anxiety and then I end right. up just getting like one yeah, shot that we could have done with the dolly <laughs> booming up or something, you know, and how you, how you control that. I'm curious. I do have this, like, um, you know, you know, like when you end up like for a lot of, a lot of dudes, right? Like we buy Jordans and it's usually the Jordans we couldn't afford when we were growing up. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and so <laughs> you like your thirties buying the stuff you wish you could have bought in your twenties. Exactly. It's like, it's like I'm doing this for fourth grade right. and like, <laughs> you know, and so like I'll often I'll be like, I want a high and wide, mm-hmm. you know, like sure. why? Yeah. Because in all the indie things I ever made, I could never put the camera higher than eye level. You're speaking my language, buddy. <laughs> That's how I feel At, literally to this day. Anytime the camera booms, it could be a two mm. inch boom. Like that, the difference between right. a doorway dolly and a Dana dolly it physically makes me feel better. A very simple, teeny tiny upgrade. It's all standard kit now. But like for right. the longest time, when you come up indie, 
right? And you're like yeah. hauling gear yourself or whatever. The difference between renting a truck and like, you know, your friend's pickup is, you know, yeah. you can't get a Dana or a Fisher on one of those on a consumer car, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, the Dana Dolly, you know what the Dana Dolly is, right? It's oh, 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 oh my God. I've been saying the Dana right? Dolly. Sorry. I've been saying Fisher. Or I meant Fisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hydraulic boom is what I'm talking about. Thank yeah. you, Warren. Uh, not the, yeah. we all have the Dana Dolly. The, the skateboard. The, the skateboard wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which the uh, Dana Dolly is not. My DP, I'm always. One I of love my a DPs, Dana Dolly. I'm always like, yeah, let's bring the Dolly Hero to this. And he's always setting up the Dana Dolly. I'm like, we have the fish, or why are we using the Dana? He's like, it's just easier. I'm like, no. What if I want to go up one inch? I'm going to turn all these apple boxes sideways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. You know, I always feel like in every episode, I'm like, when, when will I go high? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and it's, and it's kind of, the, it's kind of what you're talking about. Like the other side of it too, is like, I remember I've done plenty of things, but I, I did this one shot. Actually it was a mythic quest. And like, it's like this Camaro barreling toward camera, pulling mm-hmm. into a parking lot. Then it, it makes a, it kind of whips to the right to go to pull it to park and the mm-hmm. camera is on the on the techno crane, moving with it, and it fucking moves right inside the window into a profile shot of Rob. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of like turning of wheels that was happening mm-hmm. with the with the with the operator, I was like, "You're killing it!" Shit. Yeah. Oh you know? man, when <laughs> and, when you know your crew is just like doing something highly technical, the joy right. you get. Oh man. And did it yeah. make it into the cut? But it got cut. It, it got cut up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. So, That's you know, yeah. <laughs> and so you, then you kind of learn, like, well, if I can, so then then you learn, well, if I can, if I can tether dialogue to this, mm-hmm. I got a better shot of of preserving it. So then you start, like, you know, finding these little tricks to to keep it. But I always repeat this, but Payman Benz, he was always he would always complain about having his blocking get really getting stale basically you'd have people come yeah. in they'd sit down they say their lines and they'd leave and that'd be the scene so we would ask what's the one piece of dialogue we cannot cut from this scene and he would uh-huh. have the character move on that line so uh-huh. that he knew like okay we can have someone come in say say the first half of the scene walk somewhere else and then have the second half of the scene and know he's going to be okay no one's going to be mad at him right yeah kabir do you know kabir akhtar uh-huh. I know who he is, yeah. He was an editor first, you know, he edited in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, a bunch of stuff. He's mainly a director now, but he was telling us kind of all the tricks of like what shots you can cut and can't cut in TV and how to save performances and, and do different things. But I always, I guess that Payment Benz trick, all these these various things are, it's interesting that as directors, we have to think about how to get the stuff we love to remain in, in the cut by the end of the <laughs> you know, by the final cut, it's not something you learn in indie film or short films mm-hmm. or anything when you're in control because you build the whole scene around that shot. But when someone else is in control, you're just praying that your your stuff makes it in there. I love to watch the cut that airs because then I can mm-hmm. really get a sense of like, if I go back, what can I, what, uh-huh. what's welcome, you know, sure. like, like, um, like for instance, um, you know, on on one hand, there'll be things that I've done. I'll be like, yeah, I think that I think that might work. And I'm like, oh, you cut that whole shit. Okay, great, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. noted. You know, and then I think of times where, you know, I always want to make sure the DNA of the show was preserved. But um, in this episode of Love Life that I did, um, the second episode of season two on the very last take of the final shot, I'm doing this like slow push in to William Jackson Harper after like a night from hell um, Mm -hmm. with like this NYU student and this woman that he's kind of dating post divorce and all this stuff. And I was like, Hey man, just on this one, just kind of I'm like after action count to three and then look into the lens and just hold it. And I was like, I don't even think anybody knew I did it. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's not the language of the show, and it did it, and I was like, "Yeah, that's that's dope." And I put it in the mm-hmm. cut, and then I watched it, and they used it, and I was like, "Oh wow!" Like I literally was not. Exp- there's nothing about that show in in what 
18 or 20 episodes that breaks mm-hmm. the fourth wall, but they kept it. So it's like, it's kind of like a reminder, like give them what they need, go for what you want. And you know, your, your cut is like defending your thesis mm-hmm. and you know, it's gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get approved either way. You're gonna graduate, you know, <laughs> but like maybe they'll keep what you think elevates it. I love the idea. They're like, well, we had to get, we, we cut the finale because, um, <laughs> Peach just really whiffed it. So <laughs> sorry, yeah. we're one episode short this year, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry to mention Bill Hader again, but he was talking about the season finale of Barry season two and how they use these like crossfades from scene to scene. Mm. And the interviewer was asking him what, what the intention was behind that. He's like, Oh, you know, it like we were, it just felt a little too episodic the way we had it with these straight cuts. So we just tried crossfades, even though we've <laughs> never done them before in the show and it just, just worked. So right. we just did it. And like, sometimes, you know, I, like what's frustrating to me as a director, especially in the commercial world is like a lot of times you get to see one edit and then you email notes or leave them on frame IO or something. And you're not right. sitting with the editor and then they kind of implement them. Some of them exactly the way you said, but some of them totally wrong. And a lot of times the ones that they implemented exactly the way you said, like aren't working. Mm-hmm. And it's wow. like, it's a medium where you just don't know if something works until you see it, you know? Right. And yeah, so you want to maybe, try it out, but you yeah. can't say like, oh, undo that. So if the language of the show is that nobody ever looks into the lens, but all of a sudden they're looking at the lens. Yeah, of course, they'd reject that because that just doesn't make any sense. But hey, once you did it, all of a sudden, hey, that actually is pretty cool, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, well, so. and I think it speaks to also, you know, we've been talking so much about the part of the job of the director being like servicing the vision of the show. But if the tone and the world is consistent and ironclad, then it kind of actually facilitates those opportunities to kind of push at the walls and bend things a little bit. Right. You know, we're kind of trained to not do that sometimes. And so I love the idea of like, you know, knowing in your director's cut, you're trying things out. You have the audacity or the the confidence, I should say, to like be like, "Hey, this is what I think is good. Don't worry, we have we have it the way you were expecting, but give this right. a shot. You know, right. let this sink in for a second. Whereas, like, I I could imagine if it were me in the editing room being like, "Ah, oh, that's really cool, but they'll never go for it. Put the other take in, you know, mm. and then you don't even give them the shot to to make their own mind up, you know." I, I yeah. mean, this is an evolution, though, too, because I will say, you know, early on, you know, in the first bunches of episodes, I would probably play it more safe. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you get to the point where you're like, OK, they know me. They know I get the show. Mm-hmm. So now, like, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit and they'll be like, OK, we see that. But no versus like, what's he doing? You know, as, <laughs> an, as a knee jerk reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I almost feel like what you're saying. I feel like it's, it's, I take it as my responsibility to present something unexpected. A vision, exactly. Like a vision of this that's in line with what you do. But like, that's the whole thing about collaboration, right? Like the, I, if you hired correctly, which is their job, not mine, <laughs> right? Like if they've hired correctly, then they've got a whole bunch of people who are offering wardrobe that they hadn't necessarily thought, you know, takes as an actor that they hadn't necessarily predicted, you know, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an idea around the scene that perhaps they hadn't envisioned, but it's all driven by what they did right. And what they and what they did right, you know, butterflies out to have different responses from different people. And, you know, it's great when people recognize that that's what a script is actually doing. Yeah. Inspiring other experts to kind of manifest their own creativity. I love that. Right. When you show people when you do something like that in the edit, that's a little unexpected. Do you set them up like, hey, I did this thing and, you know. In the this mm-hmm. right before the end of the second act or whatever, that 
you know, it's kind of, I think it's super exciting. I don't know how you guys will feel about it, but I think it, it's cool. Or do you just let them see it sight unseen or with no, no yeah, notes? These are, I got to say, man, you guys have great questions. Um, I just stuff we want to know. <laughs> I used to write like a fucking email and be yeah. like, and, and share it with like, you know, the, the writer, the showrunner, whoever needed to be, the, I thought needed to be the recipient of it. And then I was like, whatever you know why they'll watch it you know like like or or because look i've heard that at some places like they don't even watch the cuts now i i think that's rare and i think that's a certain kind of show but like i was just like you know what they'll watch it if they don't like it it's there at the end of the timeline all the scenes are there i like they're just not in the chronology of it but like if you wanted to pull up 42 and 38 that I omitted or, or carved out lines, you can get it. It's all there for you. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I kind of let them experience it. Um, I, I, you know, one thing that's actually even more freeing these days is, and I don't know if this is the right thing to do or not, but as I direct episodes that are bigger episodes and are kind of manufactured to be far beyond running time, Mm-hmm. Uh, I've now been like, well, I'm not going to give you a 65 minute cut. Like, I just mm-hmm. can't. I just feel like I've done nothing. I've done no service to you at that point. Right. Because mm-hmm. the editor's cut was 68. <laughs> so, right. like, you know, I might then be like, okay, I'm going to fucking go for it. I'm going to rearrange things. I'm going to like cut lines and carve things out. And um, I'm going to stand on that because I feel like I, what am I doing if I'm just giving you something where you've got to do everything? Like somebody has got to give you a perspective here. I mean, the editor's cut is that cut. If they're like, Hey, we want to see literally everything we wrote. They've got it assembled and pretty and ready to go. But like he, I'm going to take a swing at what I think the episode really should be. And if that means some restructuring or rewriting or whatever, you get to check that out. And, and right. I'm curious, how regularly, what's your batting average? Do you feel like with those big changes, do they keep most of them? Do they ignore most of them? I feel it's pretty good. I mean, every now and then I'll do something like, I'm cutting that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I'll, and I'll look at like the network cut and I'll be like, oh, okay, I'll put that shit right back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but, then, but then I still say, okay, well, why did they do that? And, and it's like, oh, well, their perhaps take on what the audience is going to need. Um, maybe we have two different ideas on that. You know, um, I'm a less is more person. You know, I'm a, like, I'm like, if I find any whiff of redundancy, I'm like, cut that, cut that, cut that. You know, um, I think there's a, there's a um, great TED talk by Andrew Stanton where he's mm-hmm. like, you know, audiences want two plus two. They don't want four. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and anytime like I can kind of see the math is not mathing, I'm I'm just kind of like, well, let's lose that. Like what what's the value of that if it's just like filler. A deluge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you know what I mean? But I don't know what they say. I don't know if they're like this fucking guy, you know. Like, <laughs> well, you keep getting asked back, so I imagine <laughs> not so bad. My last thing, I'm curious. You know, you said obviously the director's one of the main jobs is blocking in TV, but you're also, you know, working on performances. Like, you know, you gave us the example of like looking right into the lens. But I'm assuming with some of the day players, people that are just on this episode, you're probably much more involved in their performance. Can you tell us a little bit about like kind of some of your, your strategies or approaches of like making sure you're getting performances that are funny or dramatic or in tone? What's your prep involved in terms of like performances? Like, do you write verbs on your script? Do you have ideas for alt jokes or business or, or what is it? I try and when I read the script, like I, I first do a read as, you know, a person, you know what I mean? Like, and then after that, I kind of go and, and, and read it from different department heads points of view. And then somewhere after reading it as a, as a DP, a production designer, a, you know, costume, or I look at it from the actor's point of view and I try and, have like 
you know, and look, I, right now I'm, I'm really talking like ideal scenarios where like I get the script with enough time to do all this shit, you know, mm-hmm. but like, um, I'll try and give each scene a title that I've decided, you know what I mean? Like, so like, mm-hmm. you know, this is the scene, you know, this is match sure. redemption. This a is shorthand. Name, yeah. Yeah. Just like, hand. yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then I'll, uh, <laughs> and then I'll go and then I'll break it down the beats of it. Um, <laughs> one thing that is, um, what, so I, so I try and be prepared to kind of, you know, support and or guide the series regulars or guest stars, you know, with Mm -hmm. ideas. Right. Um, one thing that is, I think Paris Barclay had said this in an orientation that I took. He's the former head of the DGA, super accomplished director, like awesome guy. Um, he talked about how, you know, you can use the guest star to direct or or push the regulars on the show. Mm, because a that. lot of times, you know, you might, and this is like a generalization, but you might find, or you could find that, you know, number one or two or five to eight are kind of like, this. what I do. Been doing mm-hmm. it 89 times. Like, appreciate the enthusiasms, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, cool, thank you. <laughs> And then you've got this guest star and you're like, you know, Hey, let's go for this. And they start, you know, miming moments and doing things. And I've done that. And I've watched, you know, that regular look up and be like, Oh shit. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we're, are we acting again? Okay. You know? And so like, that's like a really good tool to get things out of a scene that you probably couldn't by asking someone who's been there um, and you have to be a little more deferential to perhaps. Um, And then, you know, just really kind of being ready to your question with like, you know, I have this thing called the actors um, thesaurus and you can look through it and kind of get a variety of different words, you know, Mm -hmm. or synonyms for like a word. So you can kind of, you know, uh, don't accuse, but, Mm-hmm. provoke you know right, what I mean or whatever right. and and you have all that ready because you know sometimes um one example I can think of is like I remember doing an episode of Grey's Anatomy and this woman's you know son had like a leg amputation and he had kind of hid it from her it was like a sports injury or whatever and it's like this big scene and yes it's dramatic Mm-hmm. But no, it's not fully dramatic because mm-hmm. the show is not going to do it like that. And I, I recall kind of watching when I was like giving this note to kind of. And, it, and it's tough, too, because you never want to talk about what, what you need for the audience. But sometimes it is an audience. It's a tonally driven mm-hmm. note. You know what I mean? And so. Sure. Um, I remember kind of watching the preparation disintegrate <laughs> because it was like she had prepared to do it in a particular way. And now it was like, no, it's actually not like that. It's kind of like this like 160 degree pivot to something different. Mm-hmm. And it's like I could kind of see like the detachment happening. And it was like, look, it's the same thing emotionally. It's just like, let's get to the place where we, you know, find this kind of um, emotional challenge with what's happening for her. Um, mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm babbling, but you're just trying to find. No, no, like, this is no, really interesting. It, it, it's great because I think, you know, it's a thing that we talk about on the show all the time. Like what happens when a performance kind of goes off the rails or maybe you know, I think you're kind of describing a situation where someone has performed it or, or kind of it's, it's become rote for them. And that's like not exactly into their brain and not what you need. And that's when the the real tools of acting, I think, come into play. And, you know, a good actor or a great actor can adjust, can play it any which way you want because you're there to kind of facilitate that with your list of verbs or whatever. But like 
an inexperienced actor doesn't necessarily have the tools to pivot yet, right? And it kind of sounds like maybe part of what you're describing also is like that instinct from an actor to show how upset they are when like most of the time people are trying to hide how upset they are. Right. But you, you hear drama, you hear Grey's Anatomy and you're like, my son's leg will never be back. <laughs> right. It's you like know. Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's like, yeah. as a director, that's it's, in, what do you it's do? Scary, yeah. Right. I've yeah. been in that situation where I'm like, like, I know if I can like, take this person on a side and we can like, mm-hmm. have a drink mm-hmm. and like have 20 minutes right. and calm mm-hmm. down and rethink about this and talk mm-hmm. about the characters. Maybe we can get there. But like I have four seconds, you know, I, we're yeah, 30 right. minutes behind. What's the, the producing director? Thing? Pete just came to set. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's whispering right. to somebody. He's already told the DP to change the lens. <laughs> you know what, you know what I, I've kind of found as like, and it's such a weird job as we all know, but like, I have found the challenge of the job is that, you know, it's like you're called the director, right? So like we kind of have, some of us at least have kind of come up with a particular idea or assumption of what that means, right? Mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. you've got all the ideas, you're guiding this thing. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, I, I do more question asking than anything. You know what I mean? Like I'll say, well, okay, well, like, well, why, why are you kind of approaching it like this? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. In that response, I may get what I need to direct. You know, right. Oh, well, I'm right. thinking this. Oh, well, what if we were to approach it like this? And for these reasons. And now it's like, it's an exchange versus like, you know, some dictatorial, mm-hmm. you know, sure. edict by fiat. Do it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, that's exactly. that. It's a Socratic method, right? It's when you mm. get results by asking questions. And, it, and um, you just wouldn't think that it's the way to do it. And, and a lot of times it, you feel like, um, for people who don't do this, you, you might think that you're giving up power. What you're really doing is gaining it because you're showing that you're collaborative and you're also not saying any stupid shit. Because mm-hmm. like, if you were to just come over with a note, you know, mm-hmm. If you let them reveal what the thing is first, you can say something more valuable. The more experience I get, the less you worry about who thinks you're good at your job or who who thinks you're in control. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it is ultimately always about results and your methodology. And like, yeah, I think that most people think that a director comes in and just kind of barks orders yeah. and then makes everyone better somehow by doing that. But like anyone who's done the job for half a second knows that that's the dumbest approach possible, basically. Right. <laughs> or at least I, I it love, sounds like not our style, I guess. Is what I, I love mean. asking a basic question. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. I, like I'm, I'm bidding what time for, is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm bidding for a commercial now. And, and the producer was like, we were talking about, casting and she's like sending me this thing and it's like says OCP OCP uh you know we have these two celebs and we have two OCP and so I google OCP you know like okay on camera performer and I'm like all right like what does this mean to me like why what are you look why, why are you why telling do I me care this? yeah you know <laughs> what I mean like and I was like three years ago I'd have probably fronted like I knew what mm-hmm. I, I'd have tried to extract what she was telling me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're just like, like Yo. dreaming of context. Clues. I was hoping you would have been like, yeah, Oregon Catholic Press, OCP. <laughs> Super familiar. Which is why it comes up if you Google it. <laughs> yeah, advertising uh, especially is like filled with weird acronyms. Oh, yeah, that they're are, always like, like the, so hard to, to Google too. What, yeah. what do they call oh, OLVs? You know, that's no, like what a, is that? Yeah, I don't an, know what that is. Online video. It's basically... A commercial that's going to run on like Instagram or YouTube or whatever. Uh, they call yeah. it the OLVs or the linear, yeah. right? Is like mm-hmm. the sure the linear versus ones. digital is what I would call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, my move that I feel like works in everything in life is just like giving other people credit for my ideas. You know, mm-hmm. like oh, you know, like I'll be like, yeah, why? Like, what would you do if you were in this situation? You know, where like you don't know if you you can get to that knife first or. <laughs> or you know run out the door like 
do you think you would look there? And then whenever they say, I'll be like, you know, yeah, what you're saying makes me think like you would maybe go for the knife, you know, like. <laughs> right. Um, right. I think Pete is saying, listen to people. And Oren, you were saying, this is how I incept people to do the thing no, with my preconceived no, idea. I think we're both saying <laughs> pretend to listen to people. I don't think Pete is saying that. I don't want to put words into anybody's mouth. <laughs> Make them feel like you're, we were both agreed that they should feel like you're listening. Yeah. Definitely yeah. They should, you should be looking them in their eyes, but they don't, they don't know what you're thinking. Yeah. That's the point. I, I, I have really kind of in, I'm trying to make a more concerted effort to, be genuine and be straightforward with people about that. And also like, you know, show enthusiasm and positivity and not be competitive with people. I think that like, there's a lot of like, especially in the advertising world, a lot of people kind of vying to take credit for ideas or jokes or, or, or be the top dog or any of that stuff. And it's all fine. It's fine. Sure. Whatever. But like, I'm going to show my enthusiasm for your idea. I'm going to stand up for my own ideas. We're all in this together. And I think that like the more you can kind of in a really overt and explicit way, show people that you are down to collaborate with them openly and honestly, I think it serves you well. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite things on commercial shoots is when the client pitches a joke on set. That's funny. That's actually good. Oh my God. Yeah. It's great. And I'm like, oh. Ooh, that is good. Let's do it. And it's like, it makes me so happy because you know, nine out of 10 times the joke is just like offensive or like unusable or something. And you're like, okay, uh, yeah, this guy wants you to say this word. And then you realize their mics on and everyone heard you saying that. Um, but, uh, but when, when you really can collaborate and I think people are building on top of each other, it's, I love giving credit to other people. I, I'll, I'll tell a tiny little story along those lines and then, then we can wrap it up. Um, but uh, one of the lead investors in my wife's film um, threw a couple jokes and he had a few notes and he threw a joke in there that made it into the final cut. And he's like an investment guy and like a professor and like a, a huge fan of movies, but like mm-hmm. not in the entertainment world. And this is kind of his way to kind of participate. And so anyway, he flew out to a festival with us. We were sitting next to him and I'd forgotten that he'd written this line and the screening's going really well. And then I hear his joke land and I swear to God, I could feel the positive energy glow off of him. That rush of like, Oh, my joke just landed, which is probably literally the first time he's had a joke on screen react to an odd bouncing off an audience. It, if you could bottle that, oh man, it was just like electric. And I think about it all the time. And so like giving that to people, facilitating that, like yeah, whether they've done it a million it. times, not hoarding it, give it out, man. That's, it is the best. Yeah. Um, that's so awesome. yeah. 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 Story. And that guy's yeah. name is Conan O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, IMDb is like where we can see what you are just finishing up. Oh, I just refreshed and you finished another episode of a show. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we were talking. And you have your podcast, Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. You have some pretty, pretty good guests. Your first guest was Issa Rae, I believe. Your most recent guest, at least according to IMDb, is Kaylee Cuoco. So not bad. Not bad. You've even I had Pete Chapman time. on The Psychology and Techniques of Directing. But we've had Pete Chapman on twice. So I think we're one step ahead of you. There you go. There you go. And part of my deal with every show is I, I need someone from the show to come do it up, do a podcast episode. So people can listen to that wherever podcasts are found, wherever they are, wherever their devices have service. Yeah. Nah, this is awesome guys. Uh, you guys are, are, are killing it. Great hosts. You know, I love the, the banter and the back and forth and great. As I said, man, great questions. No bullshit. Like it's great talking to you because I know we all do the same job. And we all have the same passion for it. So yes, that's now we all have the same children at home. Yeah. That, <laughs> has that changed things at all in terms of like what jobs you take? It has, man. I've been like, uh, you shooting in LA, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, First question. yeah, there's gotta be a real reason for me to hop on a plane 
you know, whether it's uh, the people I'll collaborate with or the idea or genre or, you know, whatever. I used to try and, you know, I guess they call it fill out my dance card, you know, and, mm-hmm. and every possible date checked. But now I've been kind of a little more selective and, and also focusing more on pilots and, and producing things and, mm-hmm. you know, trying to, trying to have more of a hand in, in the things that I want to see on screen getting out there. Well, cool. Um, Pete, do you have a minute to hang out with us for our unpaid endorsement segment? Yeah, let's do it. Unpaid endorsements. Well, so my endorsement, I'm rewatching Barry because I, yeah. I had been so long since the first two seasons came out. I was like, oh, I love this show. I've been still kind of craving comfort food. So like I just rewatched the first two seasons. We haven't started the third yet. Let's but just say season one is much more comforting than season three. <laughs> season two, I don't know. It's pretty dark. But so season two, episode five, if you guys mm. remember, is the is the episode where Barry is sent to kill the, mm-hmm. the Taekwondo expert whose daughter mm, is yes. also in martial arts. And it is... And she's like a uh, weird creature. She She's like superhuman. She's like, they're doing all sorts of wire work. She's like climbing up trees. She She's like Wolverine X-23. Yeah. yeah from Logan. It, yeah. It is uh, such a delight. I, it might be my favorite episode of television ever. So that that's, <laughs> my, <laughs> that's my endorsement. It's pretty high up there at the very least. Uh, uh, specifically season two, episode five of Barry. Um, is great. What about you, Pete? Anything cool? So I'll, I'll stay in line with that. My unpaid endorsement would be Atlanta season three. Just wrap that up the other night with a baby. You, you got to get it in when you can. And the half hours, and this is where half hours are really great, like you're saying, because you can kind of like, you know, plow through them much quicker than an hour. And that's obvious math. But mm-hmm. um, I just thought that it was it was amazing to watch something where I just felt like the creator was doing exactly what they wanted to do. It's creative. It's funny. It's artful. It's you get it or you don't. And it's kind of a North star for the shit that I would personally like to do. So it was very rewarding and refreshing to watch. Um, I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, act and get a job on like a really huge NBC show and then do mm-hmm. music so I can mm-hmm. be in a position to to do this. But Pete, I think it's helpful if you maybe like write on like a famous sitcom, like straight yeah. out of college too. I think <laughs> like that's, if yeah. you start there. Or if your sketch group has then, a feature at Sundance. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, yeah. Before I mean, you graduate film school. Start at like 19 or yeah. 20 and just be incredibly talented in multiple disciplines. Well, you did have yeah. a feature at Sundance. I had, a, that- I had a short. I had a short. So I'm, oh, short. I'm, I need to rethink these things. But you guys have a <laughs> The recipe is there. I just, yeah, I just sure. have to rewind time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's called. Uh, they they make spanks for men. Are you familiar with these? <laughs> they wear yeah, them over do. your stomach. They pull your gut in, and then you're like 15 years younger. Or in what you got, buddy? <laughs> I got a new computer, a Mac Studio. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've covered some of this stuff. That that 27 inch iMac has been discontinued. It's one of the biggest uh, tragedies of our time Uh, i'm not not i'm kidding there's bigger tragedies uh but for me it was a pretty big blow because i've been waiting five years to upgrade my uh 2017 imac and now they're they're not making them anymore and the imac is like the perfect computer it's got this um, incredible screen one of the nicest screens you've ever seen the 5k retina you know fast computer it's like beautiful keyboard and mouse and everything just works and just need you know a new computer to do 4k video and all that stuff VFX. And so I am selling my old iMac because Apple, they're jerks. They won't even let you use this beautiful computer as a monitor for any different computer. And so I've been researching where I can get the most money for my iMac because Apple, it's a fully loaded 2017, 27 inch iMac, like biggest hard drive you can get, biggest, you know, processor, graphics, memory, everything that you can get. Apple offered me $385 for it. Um, 
B&H Photo offered me $455 for it. And then I found three other sites. I got Offer.com, CashForYourMac.com, and It's Worth More.com. And they all offered me around $930 for it. And then Facebook Marketplace, I believe I can get between eleven and twelve hundred dollars for it. So just to give you a range, if you're like upgrading, you know, I talk a lot about like why I love upgrading computers and why I think investing a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars in your career, especially if you're editing or doing posts or doing that, like is worth it getting a MacBook Pro that like I, I'm a big proponent of getting the biggest hard drive you can get because like if you're on a project and you're like running out of hard drive space to put images or videos on, like how embarrassing is it? <laughs> you're like working on very important time critical things and you're now on a hard drive space and you're deleting photos of your kid or whatever. It's just <laughs> depressing. So one of the ways that I find it much easier to upgrade computers is to sell my old ones. And if you are, you know, don't feel like you don't have enough money to upgrade, like you might be surprised by how much money you can get for your current one. So, so yeah, so I got offer cash for your Mac and it's worth more.com. I don't have any, I don't care about them at all. They're just the ones that offered me the most money for my computer. And if you're looking to upgrade, it's worth checking them out unless you want to do the work of like the Craigslist or the Facebook marketplace and meet the person and package and negotiate and do all that crap. Otherwise, these other places will usually just send you a box postage prepaid, put your computer in there, put them in the mail and you're done. They give you the, the money. So anyhow, that's my endorsement is uh, sell your old computer and your iPhone too. You can use all that money to upgrade faster. Pete, this was wonderful. If you have questions for Pete or ourselves, you can email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. You can tweet at us across all social media at justshootitpod. And you can follow me at Mr. Matt Enlow. And I'm on Twitter. I'm at Smitey Pileg. On Instagram, I'm at O. Kaplan. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. And the music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And rate us on iTunes if you get a chance. We always love seeing those. And we will catch you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.